the cloud. Okay, we're recording now. Cool, perfect. Bam. Okay, <laughs> recording on. So let me admit Jackson Rivera to the room and go. Okay, so welcome everybody to 463 Anatomy of the Game every Wednesday at 7 p.m. This is the last class before the drop. So we hope you're going to stay with us for this learning, learning, learning ride that we are already on um, across the game industry. Next slide. I'm hoping everyone is on Discord, but if you're new, um, all the information about the class is in Discord. We ask questions in Discord. Um, here is the service or anyone in the class who is not in the Discord, because this would be the week to get into it. You haven't missed anything, but you need to get in the Discord in order to reap the full benefits of this class. So in the chat, is anyone not in the Discord? If you're in the Discord, type yes in the chat. It'll be where homework is posted. Yes, please join all the things. Thank you. We're seeing some yeses in the chat from people who are in the Discord. Once again, you haven't missed anything yet, but this would be the week to get into the Discord. All right, I'm not seeing any no's. I'm seeing some yeses. So I'm going to assume that you're indicating that you're all in the Discord. If you're not, but you need more time, you can also contact the essays and they will help you get into the Discord. Um, or you can, of course, scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now. Okay, onward. Um, next slide. So automation, you know this part in the Discord, you've already hopefully chosen the roles that are all in the Discord. If you're just visiting, you can choose the walk-in role. See right here, as described, leaf and the sun. Next slide. Nickname, let us know your pronouns. We want to label you properly, respect you. Um, this is how you change your name. Right click on your name, choose edit server profile, then you'll see nickname. Yes. Yes, Luke. Um, yeah, we have a student who, who, tra who travels virtually from Australia to our courses. If you ever wonder if you were a draw, you're a global draw here at USC. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, okay, good, your essays. Here we go, this is our guest, who's here, the creator of Super Meat Boy and the Binding of Isaac. Um, and just, just wonderful person, which is what matters. <laughs> and um, and uh, then you're gonna jump in here to next slide, your six questions. Now am it's I, your turn, yes. I'm, I'm answering these. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Edmund McMillan. I'm, I go by, I don't really care what pronouns you give me. <laughs> I'm a guy, but you can say whatever you want to me. Um, what is my school year, grad year? So I, I graduated high school mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, I went to community college for a few months. I failed most of my classes, but I took um, some, I lied and I took, I, I took a bunch of classes that had prereqs for them. And I just said, yeah, I had that somewhere else. And then uh, I learned a lot from those classes and I went home and I made a website and started making games. Um, I'm from Santa Cruz, California. <clears throat> Something that I love. I love my family. Ooh. I love playing pinball with my wife currently. Oh, so, that's awesome. <clears throat> which game or interactive media means the most to me and why? Interactive, eh? Um, a pure game could be, you know, something. Um, means the most. That is an extremely difficult question. I'm sorry if you, if you're hearing the freeway. That's very far from me. But no, it's it's not bad. Okay. It's not bad. Because <laughs> for me, it's very loud. Oh, okay. No, it's not on your mic. <laughs> okay. Um, the game or interactive media that means the most to me is Magic: The Gathering. I oh, think okay. that I think that is the game that has influenced me the most in my career. It is the most. It's the been the constant 
I started playing when I was 13, 13, 14 years old, like right around when it came out and got popular, stopped playing when it didn't, got back into it like seven years later. And I've been playing for the past almost, almost 20 years. Um, so yeah, that's, and I still play on the weekends. It's, it's become an obsession um, and it's always been there for me to pilfer. I, I, a lot of the games that I'm like Binding of Isaac was, was very inspired by Magic the Gathering and Eugenics, which I'm currently working on is also inspired by it. So I'd say that that's probably my number one, the one that meets, means the most to me. Very cool. Well, welcome, Edmund. Um, glad to have you back with us. A whole new set of students. So we, oh, yeah. we begin again. We begin. So <clears throat> I wonder yeah. if my answer was the same last time. I don't remember. I, <laughs> huh. I, I'm not, I'm unsure, but, but well, actually for those students who are interested, you could actually go back to when, when Edmund spoke here before and see all the questions the student asked him before, because it's all the Discord server, because history, but this is your time. So let's go back to high school. You're like, you're a game creator. Like you, you turned pro, right? So these students, many of them, you know, are either before their real game creation path or, or yeah. sort of perceive themselves to be early in it. But I mean, you got right at it. So maybe talk about, um, you know, were you always a game maker? Were you making paper games and dice games and, and all sorts <clears throat> of games like always? Or when did it kick in to move from, from consumption of games, right? Just play. Yeah. Like, I want to be on the other side of, of shaping an experience somehow, some way. Well, honestly, in the 90s, even with Doom, even with knowing that Doom was a small team, right? it didn't seem remotely possible that I could get a job at a video game company and be anything more than a cog in a machine. And that was the most discouraging thing for me. So I just pushed it out of my mind. It was not an option. Like working in games wasn't an option because I knew I'd just be a grunt and I wouldn't be able to do anything fun. Um, and what I did before I made games was I made comics. Oh. Um, and <clears throat> I did the similar things that I'm doing with games, except, you know, without the interactivity, I was writing about myself, my personal experiences and the things that I was into at the time and the things I couldn't figure out myself. And I, I wrote and drew and, you know, let it all come out and just put it out there to the public. And then I tried my best to see how other people viewed it. So I can get a good idea of what I was doing from somebody else's perspective. And I just kept going. Um, I did that for maybe like six years. Well, that's, and that's a long time. So wait, so I mean, I'll just slow you down here because I mean, that's a, that's a good chunk of life. It's like, you yeah. know, you're like 18, 19 years old. So um, <clears throat> you say you started drawing comics and drawing and writing. So doing, I guess, soup to nuts. Uh, were you doing it at first for yourself, for your friends, like to eat food, just to be heard? Like what was your- I, I like, think I was doing it to, to be heard. I think okay. I was doing it to say, say something and um, express something that I was unfamiliar with exactly what it was. It was, it was artistic expression in a very abstract form. I was a very angry, angsty teenager. And I wrote about that. Mm -hmm. I wrote about whatever it was that was bothering me and interesting to me. And, and it just came out in a bunch of weird ways. And I learned from what I produced and um, it, it, it got, it was weird enough or good enough or whatever you want to say to get the attention of a few local newspapers. And it made me feel validated. And I felt like maybe I should continue to explore these things. Um, but it was very underground, edgy, weird comics. Ah, um, just so I can just get, sorry, just for me, did you write comics like, like comic books or like comic, like comic strips? Um, they're weird. I mean, you could say they were something akin to our crumb or, um, old, you know, psycho skate skater, psycho zines and mags and stuff oh, from, from, okay. from the eighties and nineties. I mean, this, right. the zine scene was a thing still in the early nineties. Like there was a, you know, the internet wasn't really a thing yet. Um, and the people that would eventually probably go on to make a bunch of internet, cool internet websites started out making zines. A uh, Newgrounds was actually a zine. Um, a, ne a Neo Geo zine before it was actually Newgrounds. 
Um, Does everyone know what Newgrounds is? Because so just you know, everyone you should you guys games. should know what Newgrounds is. Okay. It should be it should be imperative for you at this point. If you want to make games, especially independent games, you want to know what Newgrounds is. It still exists. It's still it's still uh, relevant. Uh, the creator of Newgrounds is Tom Fulp. Um, you would know him from Alien Hominid, um, Castle Crashers, uh, and there's a bunch of stuff he's working on now. But Newgrounds is you know his claim to fame. Um, and it was Newgrounds was, which is eventually where I went. So mm. I'm making I'm making comics. Okay. And I'm stealing from Kinkos. There was this thing called dropping the key. You could drop the key on the ground and it would reset. And then you plug the key back in and it would, you you you'd basically cheat the system and then you'd pay for whatever. Or you'd befriend somebody who is also a zine maker too. And you're like, look at what I'm making. They're like, ah, I'll look the other way. And you can make, you know, hundred copies of your comic. Okay. <clears throat> and I would sell my comics locally at any place that would let me. Um, I actually sold at Borders, and they, <laughs> my comics got thrown into thrown at someone's face, and then they had to put them behind the counter. Somebody saw the content in them and got very upset, and then um, it was a behind the counter deal, and then no more once Borders was gone. But I, it's street, like Streetlight and and a bunch of local comic shops I used to sell, and I'd make enough money to print the comics again for the most part. Um, and make them a little bit better, like maybe color color covers or something like that. Um, and I did that for a while. And, I, and then I decided I was going to... Uh, people kept telling me about this comic called John of the Homicidal Maniac, which was being published by Slave Labor Graphics, which was an independent publisher just over the hill from where in San Jose. And um, they were like, oh, it's pretty similar to what you're doing. You should try to get picked up. And I was like, okay, I'm going to really try. So I sent them like a package of all my stuff i actually sent it to a few different um uh, like there's some san francisco independent comic publishers too to try to get picked up because i'm i'm hoping you know i'm getting out of high school at this point and i want i want to be published i want some amount of money from what i'm doing um and i got rejection letter after rejection letter and it was crushing it was super crushing and i got so frustrated and i just ac accepted defeat but the defeat was okay well how can i bring this to more people than you know 100 people at streetlight or locally in santa cruz like how can i reach further and that was at the point where i was going to cabrillo college community college and i was taking oh. um flash and uh, dreamweaver html classes and stuff like that and i was just eating up what i could i took everything home with me you know made my first website um and fell in love with flash um which was an interactive web tool at the time. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and I started making interactive comics and the interactive comics turned into interactive animations. And then the interactive animations started to become games. And I started to hate programming. <laughs> so I started to work with programmers who were way better than me. Um, and one of those programmers was Tom Fulp. And we worked on a game called Serious P Shy together. It never came out. Um, because he had to work on this game called Alien Hominid for console. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that point in time where I was just churning out animation after animation, comic after comic, putting everything on new grounds, getting, you know, thousands of views. It was like, it was like YouTube back then, like new grounds in the early two thousands was YouTube for a very specific group of kids who were very creative and, um, kind of outcasts for the most part, all the zine kids, all the, all the weirdo artist kids and, and all the angsty teenagers all congregated there and made obscene things. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and you could win little awards for them. And like people would, you know, heckle you for the most part, but it was still a lot of interactivity and you were seeing that all, thousands of people were seeing your stuff. It went from, you know, I know I, I, at least 87 people saw my comic at Streetlight Records to, oh, there's, you know, 10,000 people that have, that have played this game this week or whatever. Wow. Okay. So that was a huge, huge, huge thing for me. And I was like, holy crap, like, this is awesome. I still didn't consider myself making games. I still was there felt like I question, like, were there like getting more, like, I guess, feedback, I guess, maybe than you would when, when it's sort of small and 800 people read it, yeah. you're not going to get a lot of. Yeah. You don't get any. Discussion. Like yeah. I think in the, in the, in the many years that I made comics, I got two cause I put my snail mail address. I was desperate. Like my, my PO box was on the back of every single one of those comics. Please write me three times, three times. I, I got letters in, in those years. And <laughs> one was from 
somebody's mom in Mexico saying, how dare I let a kid have these comics? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't who fucking knows who that is. It's like, I didn't give these comics to this kid, um, but it was a scathing letter, which was fun. Um, I used to get a lot of hate mail back in the day, but um, yeah, it, it went from, it went from basically nothing to uh, just a shitload of feedback. It was, it was throwaway feedback for the most part, but it was still, you know, it was still felt like there was relevance to what it was. You, you could almost tell by the, the fervor and the, and the, how aggressive and hateful of comments were that you knew that these, these people were actually pretty passionate about whatever they saw for the most part like they were, <laughs> they were giving caring. they were giving you something you know okay. it wasn't nothing it yeah. wasn't void it wasn't like this is so boring i'm not even going to comment it's i hate you die you know you fat pig etc wow uh, <laughs> those, that's the usual that's uh, that's how the internet was back then yeah. um but it was it was inspiring in a, a lot of different ways like it was so chaotic it was such a whirlwind of um of creativity and so many people were making so many bonkers things and so many people who went on to become really significant people like on YouTube and stuff like that. A lot of really great creatives started back then um, at on Newgrounds. Yeah. Uh, and um, Did you all know each other. Like, was there sort of like a, like, I mean, we talk about that. Was there like a Newgrounds? We knew, of each, I think we knew of each other okay. but for the most part. I mean, I didn't associate with many. I mean, I knew Tom, I knew Tom's brother. Um, I knew Calder, which was the programmer that I worked with back then. Um, and then it's kind of funny because over the years, so I, I, I eventually segued into like, once the, the Tom thing happened and I'm like, oh my God, like I was, I was this close to something great. And now he's got to go and make this console game. Yeah. What the hell am I going to do? And <clears throat> this whole time, of course, I'm actually working real jobs. Like I was, I worked many, many different jobs and I did all this stuff when I got home. Um, and uh, I think I was working at, I was probably working at GameStop at that point in time. And I was looking for another job and I was doing some freelance artwork and stuff. Mm -hmm. And somebody that I had worked with at a kiosk in the mall at one point was like, there's a video game company down the street from where you live called Chronic Logic, which has nothing to do with weed, um, yeah. <laughs> but we'd get phone calls. Um, and they're looking for an artist. They don't have an artist there. And I remember pretty vividly because I had a website and it had forums and stuff and people would post video games. There was a game called Pontifex or Bridge Builder. And it was this physics-based bridge simulation game where you drive cars, you build this bridge and then you drive cars across it and see if it holds. Um, and it was, it was like a pretty big hit on my forums. And I remembered that game from this company. I'm like, holy shit, they're just down the street from my house. Huh. I'll just go over and I'll see if they, you know, if they, if they, if they need work, then I'll work. You know, at that point, I, I think I was, I, I think I just lost my job doing animal control. And I was, I was kind of in this desperate depression hit. Like I was in this pit where I, I would always try. I'm going to ask the obvious question everyone's asking, which is like in my head, animal control, like, you know, like, Oh, there's like a weasel under my house. I'm going to go get it for you. Is that what animal control is? That's what animal control is. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's okay. also, Hey, this dog bit me and um, I need, legal documentation that you know this dog it, it, the terrible stuff too i got to do the fun stuff i mean i was the total bitch of, of like they treated me like crap there i i had to do all the really crappy work but the thing is that the crappy work was fun to me like oh. they gave me all the wilds so i i would have to scrape deads which is shoveling dead animals off the road which is works with my aesthetic um and uh getting rescuing wildlife because it was dangerous so no one wanted to do it because they get bit but i never got bit and i rescued a shitload of animals it was mostly like pulling yogurt containers off of skunks heads and that sort of stuff too like getting a a, a deer out of out of a fence stuff like that i really loved it but it was um it was a terrible a terrible end where the basically the people that i worked with were going to lose their jobs unless other people left <laughs> and they were all conspiring against each other. And it got, it got so dangerous that I had quit, <clears throat> but like a terrible reality show. <laughs> yeah. But so that was my job. Like that was yeah, my no, job no, for I, over a I, year. And I was like, that's my career. This is what I'm going to do. I'm done with that whole new grounds thing. You know, I've done with all this other stuff. Um, and then I lost my job and yeah. I was like, I need to do something like I can't, I just kind of got real with myself and it's like, what, if I really 
think about it, I never tried really hard. You know, I tried okay hard. I never really went there. Like I never really devoted myself into attempting to be independent and make art or just make art for a living. Like I never, I never really did it. So I decided to do it and I was really logical about doing it. And then people frown upon this now when I tell the story, but Hmm. what I did was I contacted as many people as I possibly could. And I said, I will work for free. Um, and those people hired me (laughs) and they paid me because I was good at what I did. And I proved that I was, and I proved that I was into it. So at that point in time, I was doing that. I was machine gunning myself into as many places as I possibly could artistically and saying, I don't have a portfolio except for a bunch of offensive comics from, you know, the nineties, um, which is mostly dick drawings. And, but I'm desperate. Like I'm good. I'm good at, I'm good at what I'm doing, but I have nothing to show for it. Let me make your logo. Like, let me make your mascot. Let me do the cover of your magazine. And they did. And, um, they all mostly eventually hired me. Um, and the same thing with chronic logic. I went in and I said, I will work for free. I want to work with you guys. This is cool. They, um, they had me do some free stuff for a little while. And then, then they said, Hey, you want to come in? We'll pay you this much. And it's, yeah, it was more than enough. Um, it's more than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I yep. started doing, I started doing some, you know, little stuff here and there. And it was it, that kind of overlapped with the Tom Fulp thing. And I was like, well, I really would like to work in games. I, it was really fun working with Tom and making these flash games online. I would, I would love to actually design something. So I kind of came up with this idea for this game called Gish, mm. um, which was a physics-based side-scroller, super basic, a Mario-like, but it utilized the strength of the programmer at the studio, which was Alex Austin. And his whole thing was physics, like, he, you know, the physics-based. He had, he had Bridge Builder, and then he had this other, like, physics-based Tetris game and stuff. So I kind of, like, riffed off of what his strengths were and designed around those. And then he took what I pitched and turned it into a prototype that we roughed out. And it just went from there. And I discovered that there was this whole, much like the zine scene, you know, in the nineties, there was this whole underground, very small niche scene of independent game developers who were making nothing. You could make nothing back then. There was, it's it's impossible to make a living off of it. Um, Unless you were id, but um there was this whole scene, like there was this place called the IGF, Independent Games Festival that was held at GEC, which just so happened to be in San Jose at the point, like just over the hill from me. Yeah. And they're like, Gish is really cool. We're going to enter it into the IGF. Um, one of our games got an award in the past, um, Pontifex. And I'm like, okay. And then we showed it there. And it was like the coolest experience ever. Like, it was like, oh my God, all, I'm getting to see these people react to what I've made. You know what I mean? I'm getting to see their face light up. They, they laugh at things. They're having a good time. And not only that, it's getting nominated for awards and all this other stuff. And um, I think it, that, that was really what solidified my career. Made me even realize, wait a minute, not only am I making games, there's this cool weirdo scene of obsessive artist type people who are making these games for no money, like for nothing, like just because it's fun to do. And that was just so cool and so super inspiring. No, um, it, it's great. Like I mean, it was the birth of an independent game generation. Like you're part of a, actually a generation of creators like in this time um, that, that, oh, that the people in this class grew up with. And right. there, there was a lot of camaraderie too back yeah. then. Like it, not so much anymore because people are, you know, sometimes at odds, but it was so tight. Like it was so small. Like you, you'd beat up with your, your buddies that you, you know, you know, they're, I knew N, I played N online and now, now Marin Reagan are there at GDC up for an award as well. And we're, you know, going out and eating at some, you know, 50s diner in, in, in San Jose. You know, it's, it was, <clears throat> it was super cool everybody I'm was super nice about the riffing like the it's so interesting i, I think about there's been like you know in my mind between pros and greats right like pros are you know get better because there's something at stake like greats it's because everything's at stake like you were all in and i want to sort of say like when did you synthesize like i really need to understand what alex austin does well and then mix that with what's coming from my mind and that is what we're going to do. A lot of people 
before who don't are like, I'm just gonna design a game and you're like in service to it. Like, why would you program what I'm saying? You actually, the way you describe it, it's very different. Like, well, it's, it's like, a, it's like very a, collaborative. It's a band, you know, like yeah. you, you need to know what the strengths and weaknesses are of the band are. You need to fill in the gaps. Like there's a really, I mean, for me, I always work with like one other person, you know, directly. And it's, it's this very yin yang situation where we kind of fill in each other's gaps for the most part. Don't write about that online. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, there's this union uh, mm -hmm. that takes place that feels really cool. Like it feels like uh, we make a one functional whole person. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, just how I work and how I've kind of always worked is, is um, I try my best to understand what the other person's bringing to the table. I try my best to design around their strengths um, and complement whatever it is that they seem to also be interested in as well. Because usually, usually <clears throat> a lot of programmers that, that I work with and they, they don't care too much about what I'm doing. They're, it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be this naked kid uh, crying on poop. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Like uh, as long as it's, I get to program <laughs> the stuff that I want to program, that's cool. And it's like, okay, um, it, you know, it's this kind of accepting like that I'm going to do my weird stuff and he's going to do his weird stuff. And uh, we're going to come together and make this cool thing and agree that, you know, agree on what's best for the game as we go. And we just ride it on out. Um, <clears throat> and that's, <laughs> that's really how it's always kind of been for me. Almost every single game, the, the more, it seems like the better the game is, the more inspired and kind of like throw my hands up and be like, well, I'm going all in like this is this is going to be some some wacky shit. And um, if you're down with this, we'll have some fun doing it. And then it usually is like the Binding of Isaac was designed and finished and uploaded to Steam in three months. It was wow. a three month game. It was a rush job. Like I'm telling you, I cut every fucking corner possible because I didn't I didn't want to invest more than three months in something like that because I was so used to making flash games. And I, and flash games were made in, you know, no more than three months. You don't want to spend more than three months on a flash game because you're, it's not going to make it, not going to be worth your time. Um, and I had just you gotten, no, was that? how did you decide who to band with? Like, so you, it is like a band, right? You yeah. have this formula, this one, one, this one, this, this duo formula that works for you. You make think, Gish and then when's Gish two, like what made you decide to how, talk about navigating that as a creator, right? Like where to I've go? Worked with, I've worked with so many different people. And I think yeah. the key the key for me when it comes to working with somebody is that they have to understand and accept my aesthetic. Mm. Um, and if they're down, then it's going to be fun. And that's usually what it is. Like a, a majority of people that I worked with after Alex, and there were a lot um, on different flash games, they all came to me as fans and said, mm. Hey, you know, I really love Gish. Um, I'm working in physics as well. Like Florian, the guy, the guy who programmed the binding of Isaac, <clears throat> He came to me as like a 14 or 15 year old kid, like after, as a fan of Gish, like I am such a fan of Gish. I figured out how to do physics in flash and I want to show you a prototype. And, you know, he'd show me this, these weird things. And I think one of the first ones that I really liked was this game called Tri Triacnid. It was just a spider. Like you grabbed its legs and you pulled it around and that's all it was. It was just this little prototype. And I was like, this is so cool that I could, I could turn this into something really neat. Like, you want to work on this together? And he's like 15, 16 at that point. It's like, yeah. So we started making games together. <laughs> this kid who barely can speak English he even came over and visited and he didn't tell me for many years that he's like, you know, when I visited you, I didn't understand the majority of the stuff that you were saying. I could barely understand English. <laughs> like He's from Austria. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, yeah, I just, if it, feel, if it feels right and the investment time isn't more than three months, mm. I think it's a fine risk. And I, I think that's usually a go-to. And I know I'm skipping ahead and I'm jumping around. No, now, no, but, no, jump around this point. Great. But like my, my number one, my number, number, number one thing for every single person who makes games, if you want to make games, make small games, a lot of them, as many as you possibly can. Work with a lot of different people. Do not commit to anything more than a three-month project until you've made at least 10 games. Period. Don't do it. It, it, it's you're going to dig yourself into a hole. You're not going to learn that much. You will learn so much from rapid prototyping, small games, game jams, 
you know, you will learn, you, you will get ex- incredibly skilled in f- making, finishing and releasing a game. Um, and I, that's my, that's my number one. The majority of people that I know that have, that have had really great success and longevity in their mm. career and made a lot of really good stuff all started out making a bunch of small games. There's a lot of flash in the pans. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I came out of nowhere and I made this one game and then that's it. Um, but the, the people with the staying power are the people who had made tons of games previously. Um, because they're game makers. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just learn. You, you learn so much more from doing um, than anything else. And um, I highly recommend it. It's also, it's also less dangerous. The point I was making too is like, I've been in situations where I've locked myself with people who are terrible. <laughs> I can stand them. You know, a few months in, it's just like, this is not going to work. And they, I I've lost years. I've lost years of my life on projects that went nowhere. Um, but whatever, because I was probably also working on two other projects <laughs> at that point in time. And, you know, you, you don't, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, um, especially when you're starting out and um, you kind of, kind of got to ride the wave. You got to ride the wave of inspiration and you got to know when it feels right. And the only way to know is from experience. You're not going to know until you've done it a few times. Well, so maybe it's better talk- to make little mistakes, yeah. not big giant mistakes where you throw away your life. Well, well, maybe talk a little about what you learned about from finishing games, right? One of the things you have to do with these, these three month games, you got to finish them. Yeah. You got to close them out. So maybe talk about that. Um, yeah, you got you to gotta lock down. You have to make a... <laughs> a mental note of, I will not cross this line, which is very hard to do, especially with games these days, because you're going to always be questioning yourself and being like, well, if I just add a little bit more here, then it'll be better. But the thing is, is usually once you have the core, once you have the core design of whatever it is that you're making and that core is fun, right? And you expand upon it a little bit. And then once you've hit that, those, those, those boundaries essentially of like, well, I could add a gardening mode. I could add uh, the ability to, you know, change 15 different hairstyles, or maybe I'll do a versus mode, you know, that sort of stuff. It's like, it's when you're learning, it's so much better to just stop it where it is, say it's done, close it. Like, it's just an exercise, really. Like, you're you're not going to make the greatest thing in the world in three months, but you're going to make something. And that's that making something is really important. Because a lot of people, a lot of game designers, I've, I've known people who've worked on the same game and are still working on the same game after 20 years and the game's not done. It's just this theoretical thing that they've been working on for forever. And it's just like, it's painful because these people probably would have been amazing if they would have just made a bunch of small games and just cut it off and stopped working on this gigantic project for their whole life. It's just, it's, um, it's something to be careful of. Because it's really, you know, us as human, we are designed to like want it bigger and better. And, and, and what if I just add this? And what if I just do this? But I say, save that for your 11th game. Um, you know, it'll get to a point where you've made a bunch of small games and it's like, okay, sink or swim now, right? You got to double down on something. You should have learned. This is what I did. So I made about 30. I made about 30 games in um an eight year period right and it got to the point where a bunch of my peers were getting you know quarter of a million to a million dollar deals from sony and and xbox and you know everything and i didn't see myself as much different than these people so it seemed like you know it's a sink or swim situation and i need to put my feet in the water i need i need to do this because I, i'm no coward <laughs> it's time to it's time to buck up and figure it out i'm making no, i'm making barely enough money to get by off my games at the eight year point in my career i had made enough money i think i made about thirty thousand dollars one year which is the by far the most money that i've ever made in my life i was living really poor poverty line you know <laughs> i didn't know i was poverty line until my tax guy told me <laughs> it turns out i was really poor but i was getting by you know um i was getting by and it, you know me and, and and my my wife both worked so we could, we did what we could but i had saved up that that money which of course was mostly eaten by taxes and i was like i'm going to i'm going to use this i'm going to use this money 
to double down on something big. I'm going to get a deal somewhere. I'm going to, how do I do that? How the fuck do I do that? I don't even know what I'm doing. Well, I did it exactly as I did it before. And what I did is I compiled everything that I had, all my games, all of my comics, all of my drawings, and I put it on a disc and I self-printed that disc. And then I actually mailed every single video game magazine and website nice. that existed <laughs> online. Nice. And I said, it's like snail mail. Like, yeah. here's my stuff. I'm giving it to you. Yeah. Like, can you please write about that? This is this has been my career for eight years. Um, and Cliff Blazinski was one of the people that picked it up. Um, I, somebody from Gears, not Gears of War. He that's Cliff. Um, somebody from Bioshock as well had picked it up. And both of those people contacted me and said, "Hey, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, great job." And I said can you please give me a contact somewhere? <laughs> like, please, like, I want to make, I want to make a console game. Please give me a contact. And um, one of the contacts that I got uh, was actually one of the, the publishers um, at, at Microsoft, um, Kevin, uh, Kevin Hathaway, who um, he was, he was the head, he was the, 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 what do they call him? He was a producer or something. Like he's the guy, he's the head hunter, the guy that goes around and picks up the indie games and is like, okay, this a BD. Is he's a BD. Sure. Yeah. Um, he did Braid. He did Castle Crashers, um, and one other. And I can't remember. Like all the good stuff, you know, that that had made millions of dollars previously. And and I'm like, I I got his information from um, from Cliff. I contacted him, and um, they're like, yeah, let's work together on something. And initially, it was it was Gish two, right? I thought, okay, we'll do Gish two because Gish was my most popular game. But at that point in time. Alex, Alex and I were kind of at odds. Um, we're good. We're good friends now, but I think he was kind of hitting his head against the wall and he was burnt out pretty, pretty horribly. Um, and it got to a point where that wasn't an option anymore. Gish wasn't an option. So what do I do? And I kind of just like looked at my back catalog of flash games. And I said, realistically, if I was going to bet on a, one of these games to remake into something bigger and better, which one would it be? And Meat Boy was my most successful Flash game at the time, like by like leaps and bounds. Like it was, it was one of the only games that somebody like would call me up and be like, "Oh my god, you know, my dorm room, everybody's playing Meat Boy." And it's like, "Oh wow, that's that's crazy." So it had a lot of name rec recognition even at that point, especially through Newgrounds. Um, and I was like, um, "Meat Boy, we'll do Meat Boy. Can we do that?" <laughs> and he's and he's like, "Yeah, sure, whatever, whatever it is you want to do, we're, we're, we'll back it." And that was basically it. And I, for, for two years, uh, Tommy and I worked on Meat Boy and I used that $30,000 to somehow magically get me through those years. Um, and um, that's, that's where my career career started. My money-making career started. My, my ability to feed myself um, with my work in a comfortable, um, in a comfortable way. And you um, were the console maker that you had experienced before when your first game didn't happen. Like now it was your time. What was that? Well, like in your story, you were talking about how, you know, your first game didn't come out because your partner had to publish their, their yeah, console game. Yeah. And that was your time. You know what's crazy okay. is when Gish was up for its award at, at the IGF, it was going against Alien Hominid. Wow. Uh, uh, we won. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it, it's a good win, though. It's one of the reasons why they don't like me at the IGF. But I think it was a, uh, I think it was a pity win. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was give give the give the award to the poor guy, but um, you know whatever. At the time, I really needed that money, and, <laughs> yeah, winning, <laughs> and was, winning winning is winning. Helpful. No, it, well, you're here. It's all it's all part of your voyage. So so you leaned into Meat Boy. Okay? Yeah, you leaned into it. What was so? And this is for the people at home, right? You had made a lot of games before Meat Boy to get to that point, and you'd even made Meat Boy before Super Meat Boy, right? So what was the it like for you then to, I guess, sort of shift gears up and be like, okay, I'm not doing things the way I did them all the way to here. I'm going to Super Meat Boy. I'm leaning into this console. I'm leaning into, you know, more perhaps yeah. deeper, richer development, different practices, mm -hmm. Xbox approvals, da 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 da. I've got yeah. I've got a marketing guy. You know, like the the new world that you were leaning into. Um, it was Alien. Um, but you know, Tommy had worked at companies before, so I yeah. think he kind of knew what to, 
what to expect. I was kind of going blind and it was, it was kind of, it was amusing for the most part because when Microsoft invests time, which, you know, we didn't take, I took no money from them um, because oh. if you take money, okay. um, that means they have control over your project. That means okay. that they, they can say, well, and this, this did happen. They can say, well, we don't think your game's going to perform well. So you should probably do this. And I did not want to ever be in that situation. So I did not take any money from them um, at all. Um, it was, it was essentially just like, how did you we know will... that going in? Cause money seems like it'd be so tempting, like tempting money. Yeah. Um... Oprah versus freedom. Like you chose freedom. I don't even know that you chose freedom. Oh, cause I'd only been doing what I wanted for eight years or okay. more. Um, you know, I guess that's a fear going in too. Like when you're working with a publisher, I, I was pretty scared early on thinking like, they're going to, they're going to fuck this up. Like I'm going to try to do something really cool and they're going to fuck it up. And they did, they tried, they tried. Um, Kevin did not. Kevin believed in the project the whole, the, all the way through, but I can tell you right now that a lot of the people that no longer of course work in that department yeah. um, did not like me boy. They did not think it was going to do well. They made it very clear that it wasn't going to do well. And even in that situation where we're being published and being, being, backed by their most prominent and successful person there um there was still a great deal of flack when it came to just like it, it it's you know kevin would always try to pump us up but whenever he got back from a meeting and he was very candid and he was just like well they think that every other game that comes out before you is going to outperform you by x you know eight ten <laughs> you know whatever okay. and uh in the reasons when i asked him why and he's like well because your game is 2d you know it's not three three d's in that's the thing like three d's in it's like but the game's good like it, it it's fun like it, it, you can't get away from that um no no well they crunch the numbers and they believe that you know <laughs> it's it's not a 3d game and this game they think this game's comparable and it sold like this and it's like well what can i say and like even when even when we got into the, it was called the games festival, um, which was a promotion that they were doing for like, I think it was a, a month, a month, a, mo a month, maybe a month, two months. I can't remember how long it went, mm -hmm. but it was like every week there was a new game that came out and we were the last game. And I was like, I knew that they put, they put us last. It was just like a whatever, but I tried to spin it and be like, ah, we're, cause we're the main course. Yeah. The like grand we're, finale. we're yeah. the, yeah, we're, 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 <laughs> you know, and I tried my best to do that as much as possible. And I did as much I, they didn't advertise for us. You know, yeah. they advertised for us by putting us into this um, festival. Yeah. I had to advertise. So I did the same thing that I did with my, my CD. And I, I, I had those uh, mailing addresses. I had those emails I saved everything that I had, all the work that I went and I had a spreadsheet um, and I emailed everybody else um, and did as much legwork as possible. Um, I think there was a point in time too, where I was like, you know what? I I'm going to take every interview that is requested, no matter how small, like if it's, it was, we did some like 15 year old podcasts, stuff like that, Like they were funny. Like it was, it was a good time. <laughs> Um, and we just, we did as many of those as we possibly could just to spread the word and, um, as many conventions as we possibly could, uh, any opportunities to show the game. I know that they, they, um, Kevin was like, we're going to try to get you into E3. They gave us one booth. Every, every other game in the festival had four and like we had one and it was like all that was there. And it fucking, it was like, uh, it was always soul crushing. And Tommy would come back and be like, uh, like, I don't know, like everybody says it's it's everybody seems to like it but anyway first game comes out in the festival beer bomb right souls nothing second game comes out in the festival bigger bomb no one cares yeah. <laughs> like, and it's nothing and nothing at all third game and it's like at that point in time and we were i think the fourth at that point in time they're like uh-oh and we got this like like okay we're pulling the festival it's like uh oh what but it's, <laughs> we're not getting anything. You're like, we were working, for, we crunched and killed ourselves to get it out by the time that we could, so we could get this promo. Cause if not, we just release it, whatever, it's whatever. And they're like, no, um, we're cutting, we're cutting the promo. <laughs> so they just released us as a regular old week. Um, and we crushed every single, like tenfold, like crushed it. And you know, those people who are like, Meat Boy's not going to do well because it's a 2D game. 
they all got promotions and got there because they got the credit for the success of the game sure. and then they moved on to other <laughs> other places with that on their resume saying like i'm the one that uh you know pushed super meat boy and blah 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 it's such a weird world man it's in and, and and that that was the point where i'm like i don't want to do this again i don't want to ever deal with these fucking people ever again like it was it was it was so much more awful than i can say I'll say that there are many NDAs in place when you sure. do these things. Well, um, I want to do that part you can talk about, which is the hustle. I think a lot of like one of the challenges for creators is not as much around creating the game, but around the part you're talking about, which is building community, building discussion, building discovery. Yeah. Right. Of your game. And you'll hear like, I don't know where to put it because the discovery is so bad, you know, on the platform. No yeah. one's going to find it. And it seems like you were like, no, I'm going to go find an audience. <laughs> I, you have, you, you, you I got my to. database. It's a different approach. And it was so much easier then. And now, yeah. now you're you're going up against, you know, the 30 something games that release on Steam every day. Yeah. It's like, it's, I feel terrible when somebody says, um, I've been working on this game and it looks beautiful. It's a beautiful game, right? You know, it's not, it's not going to win any awards it's a very pretty game. It's a functional game. They've been working on it for three years. They're releasing it on steam and then it sells, you know, a couple hundred copies and then that's it. And they, they like, why? And it's like, well, did any, did anyone ever know that this isn't going to come out? Like you, you do know, you have a pretty good idea going leading up into a release, how well something is going to do, if it's going to do terrible, if it's going to, because you'll know by how many people care about it before it comes out. Um, and I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now. Like, so I do this, I've, I've, I've released a game with nothing. I, I released um, The End Is Nigh with no press. I just dropped it. I dropped it and, it and it came out. It did not do well and it did not, well, it did okay. Um, it did not sell that well. And I think a lot of that was because of my inability at the time to talk about the project, to push the project, to excite people about the project, to do conventions to demo it for the press. I didn't do any of that. I didn't even show videos of it. It was just a trailer and it was out. Um, I Part of me wanted to just see how that would work. I had a feeling it wouldn't work uh, that well, <laughs> um, but I'm in the process now of a similar situation where I'm working on Mugenics and Mugenics is my biggest project that I've ever worked on. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been working on it for, for, it's hard to say because I started it so long ago and then stopped working on it. But um, I would say I'm working on it part-time for almost three years. And then there's another, at least another year, year and a half of development. So it'll be my biggest, longest project. Um, and we're getting to a point where once that year mark hits, I'm going to start hitting press. I'm going to start pushing, you know, blog updates. Like I have this whole plan of attack, just like I have designed for the game. Mm. I have this whole plan of attack of like, there's this blog, there's my Twitter. These are the updates that I'm going to do. These I'm going to introduce all the people that are working on it. I'm going to show gameplay. And at this point, I'm going to start showing videos. And at this point, I'm going to start streaming it. At this point, I'm going to start getting this streamer to play it. I'm going to start emailing all the press. I'm going to, there's this new feature on Steam, which is like a remote play feature where you can actually demo your game for anyone. You just get them what? an invite to it. You can demo the game. Well, I'm going to be doing that. I'm gonna be doing that as much as possible. Wait, so it's like, it's like a, is it like a live Twitch stream? Like, walk, take me, take me a step in. It's like, oh a no, it's it's a it's the remote play feature, and you could essentially start up your game, and as long as somebody's on your friends list, you could invite them to the game, and they take control over your computer or your oh, your like say, wait, someone could like a, like a like an IT person taking over your computer, but for playing uh, the game. Sure, in a way, but people you, you people usually utilize it. Like we have it in in effect for the Binding of Isaac because you can play multiplayer with people over the internet. Um, oh, okay, in the same way because you essentially they just take over the second controller on your computer, but through them. And so, there's like, there's yeah. basically no delay. And with eugenics, it's turn-based, so it doesn't really matter either way. But so, yeah, so I have so all, wait, I have a year all this countdown. stuff planned out. Yeah. A year countdown to your game, a year countdown. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and you shrink that down depending on how big the project is, right? Sure. So like, if you're working on something for three months, then yeah. for the last week or two, you're going to be push and press and you're going to be, you know, you're probably going to be talking about it the whole time if people care, right? Mm. But, you know, there's also like, well, how do you make people care? Well, I make people care by showing them what, how much I care, mm. you know, about what I'm working on. And I'm honest about that. 
um, even about the stuff that's hard. Like if I want to bitch about it and be like, oh, this is fucking grueling. You know, I, I'm, you know, I put myself out there and I just say, you know, this is, this is what's going on and here's an update. Um, <clears throat> I think putting that out there is, is important. Showing, showing little clips on Twitter or whatever your, your, your choice of, uh, um, you know, social media to get to whoever cares. Um, but it may take a few games. It may take many games. It may take many games for enough, enough people to care to matter. Yeah. Which is why I say, like, you know, if you if nobody knows who you are, no one knows what you're working on. No, nobody has any clue who you are unless you've got something that has never been done before. I, I actually told uh, somebody recently uh, as a, uh, somebody I worked with who mm -hmm. who wants to get more into game seriously. And, and he's like, well, what? And I was brutally honest with him, like, like, what should I do? Why? Is, why isn't this game doing well and whatever else? And I said, well, if you're just coming out of the gates today mm -hmm. um if you want your game to turn anybody's head it has to be really good at one thing specifically like if you're making a platformer you can't just make mario at this point because mario's already been done and it's it's some there's some, something has to be really good about it like like celeste and super meat boy are good because the level design is good um the controls are good that's all you need but they have to be unique and they have to really speak to the player. You have to find out what the genre you're exploring is, what that genre wants, what other games aren't giving in that genre. And you got to be really fucking honest about if you are actually doing it. Um, that's the hardest way to do things. Celeste, the Super Meat Boy, is taking something that exists and trying your best to make it as good as fucking possible. Reinvent the wheel. Um, that's really hard. Um, there's always coming up with something that is just like spy party, totally left field, totally new genre, you know, that has never been done before. You have to be a fucking genius <laughs> to do that. Like you gotta, you gotta luck out really well, or you gotta be an incredibly uh, creative and um, a really abstract thinker, or you could do what I did in the past and just make something that is so not like other things, so strange, so weird, so unique, so true to who you are personally, that it will turn a few heads. Um, it, it, it will, at least in passing, even if the game is, is, is mediocre, it will be like, oh, that's kind of a, a we, you know, an odd experience that I'm not experiencing right now in the mainstream. That's the easiest way to do it. The easiest, people are so... They're so stuck in these, these, these little boxes of like what you should and shouldn't make, what you should and shouldn't explore, um, what's acceptable, what's not, what the standards are for whatever else, um, that a lot of people kind of like, kind of just do the same goddamn thing. And they can think that they're doing the most unique thing in the world, but it is just the same damn thing. And I, 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 think, it's, I think it's easier than people realize to do something that is really different and, and um, odd. And even if it's just aesthetically, even if it's just theme or whatever else, as long as you've got a functional game that's pretty fun to play, you can make something really odd that will get a lot of attention. And then the last one is the most rare and that's just going viral. Well, it's like goat simulator, yeah. you know, five nights at Freddy's sort of stuff. You know, the stuff that just, you would never fucking know. You would never ever predict that that would do well and it does and it just explodes and there's no way to predict that. But that a lot of people are really going for that, going for that dice roll of like, who would have known? But, <laughs> you know, for the most part, you could, you look at games like, um, like, like Slay the Spire. Like I could tell you right now that game was going to be successful from the, from the get-go. And why? Because it's riffing off of magic. <laughs> it's riffing off of Magic the Gathering and it's doing it really well. It's like riffing off of, uh, this is another thing to explore too when you're thinking about game design. Experience things that aren't video games because it's really easy to be inspired by other things that would work in this video game environment. And there's a lot of board games, a lot of physical spatial games, a lot of movies, a lot of music that explore different things artistically that might actually be a really great asset for you 
to think from that perspective in video games and kind of abstract you know the uniqueness of it because when you think about like movies and stuff movies are so and music so all over the place games aren't really all that all that over the place they're kind of still right here um and for whatever reason people just accept that movies can go all these different directions um and be super unique and super off-putting or even bad and, and make you feel bad in a way you know but in video games it's just not you don't do that um, so there's, I, I just think there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to explore different, different mediums in video games that, that there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room for improvement, I guess I should say. Um, you just gotta really, you gotta, you gotta let yourself go loose and you gotta like let go of all of the things that you grew up with and all the things that you assume is, are correct to do. And you kind of got to make these kind of weird mistakes and experiment within those unexplored areas in order to learn yourself um, and also make something that simply hasn't been done or is unique because it just will feel like a unique experience. So these young people are coming back to a new world. And by that, I mean, we dropped a little pandemic in the middle of their college education, in the middle of your development, right? Where everyone's was away everyone's been away for two years we talk about going to conventions and talk about you know bringing a game out i'm curious for you like as the as the world is now or as the world will be right as you hope it will be in the year ahead what has what changes for you about the way you look at the way people are sharing experiencing games uh, going to convention, like what do you what do you see being maybe different for you as you as you plan for a game for a year countdown around releasing a game, if anything? I don't know. I don't think I. I don't. I don't think I think about that. Okay. Um. Uh, <laughs> it may just be that all the stuff that's been happening has not affected my life as much. Cause I'm just stuck in here. <laughs> like, I, was, are, I don't like, you... I don't like going, I don't like going to conventions. I don't like being around a lot of people. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> the world, maybe, the, maybe the world's recentered more so, around the way that you are. And, that and I, be yeah, I can tell you right now, thing. video games are selling a lot more and have sold a lot more over the pandemic. More people yeah. are playing video games. More people are playing board games. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I kind of just go, I go limp and I just, let it take me and I try my best to anticipate sharp turns. Okay. Got it. Um, what are you looking forward to the most? Uh, like with games? <laughs> or just we, 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 can go, we can go to life, but you know, life and or games. Games are a part of life. What do you, I'm just curious what you're looking forward to. What are you looking forward to the most? <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing people play Mugenics. Okay. I'm looking forward to finishing. I'm looking forward to working on it. So I'm a, I have two kids. Okay. I have a, I have a two-year-old and a, and a, a new, she'll be seven in a few weeks. Okay. And oh, it's hard. Um, two is so much harder than one. And people always said that and never completely understood exactly what that meant until it happened. Um, so my ability to work, you know, it, I can't work like I used to, you know, mm. I can't work myself to death, which I used to love doing. Um, and I can't completely neglect my wife and family <laughs> like I used to do. Um, and, you know, it's good in a way, you know, it's forced me to be a better person in that respect, but it's also kind of taken me away from my, you know, second wife, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I look, I do look forward to being able to spend more time, more dedicated time evenly like a, a good balance of, of both of these things. Cause right now it's like work is so, so down here. And I, and I love working. I, I absolutely love it. And I, when I get up in the morning, it's exciting to be able to come to work and figure out what I'm doing next and start working. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm doing it. Like you shouldn't be doing this if you don't love it. Um, <clears throat> but um yeah, I'd say that that's what I'm, look, what I'm looking forward to the most is being able to have time to work more um, on this project so I can really um, so I can really put myself in. It's it's kind of in this um, it's in this design space where uh, 
it's structurally sound. Mm -hmm. So there, every, everything's in place. It's just kind of like padding it out, making sure it works. And my end of, of uh, development usually revolves around designing little bits and pieces here and there, and then character design, uh, enemy design, and that sort of stuff too. But eventually it'll get to the point where all of the uh, structural elements are in, and I have to start getting weird and abstract, and I have to start writing a story, and I have to start writing dialogue of characters, and I have to do all this weird nonsense, which is really fun. Um, and uh, you have to kind of be in a head, different headspace for that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> looking forward to being able to dive into the weirdness that comes with making games the way I make games, which is kind of like uh, saving saving the cake for later. How do you curate for yourself um, how much listening you do versus versus authorship versus create? Because now, like when you start to let people know more about this game, it's not like the good old days. You're not going to just get like a letter from a mom in Mexico. There's going to be everybody, everybody and their sibling is going to have feelings, yeah, and yeah. wants and thoughts and this to say to you oh yeah i don't care um, okay uh, at all in any way shape or form <laughs> um i um my most dangerous project was the binding of isaac and when i was working on that project there was a point when i was showing everything to my wife when you describe the game it sounds much worse than it is when you experience the game um because for those so who have never played describe the game uh the binding of isaac is a well i'll describe the 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 uh i'll describe it in the way that would would upset people okay binding of the uh, binding of isaac is about a naked abused child um who uh go like <laughs> binding of isaac is about a naked abused child who goes inside of his creative mind as an escape from the harsh world around him because he's such an outcast even in his own home and he kills himself and you are playing out his last, a mashup of his last fever dream of everything he's experienced in life and how wrong he feels as, as, a, as, a, as a kid and how, uh, you know, scared he is and everything else. That's, that's what the, and it's all based on Christianity you know, being a negative for a creative kid when you are a creative outcast, which was all based on stuff that I experienced as a kid, yeah. you know, growing up in a um, half, a split, you know, a, a divorced, my mom and dad got divorced when I was five. So I was split between two families and um, my dad's side of the family were like super born again, ex, ex heavy drug alcoholics that now found Jesus and are like super obsessed with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then my mom's side of the family who were like Mexican Catholic who are super ritualistic. Um, and I just, it was this mashup of those things. Um, and that's what the Binding of Isaac's theme yeah. <laughs> is. And it's very abstract and very weird and it's very hard to sum up, but that's kind of what it's about. The gameplay is just like a roguelike remix of Smash TV and Legend of Zelda. Yeah. And um, it was designed to be replayed forever. Um, like a, you know, like a, arcade game like a robotron game or like or like spelunky or whatever you know um that's what the binding of isaac is but when i was working on it my wife was like this is gonna if this upsets the wrong people like if we get like a bunch of crazy christian extremists who are wanting to take me out for whatever reason that was the worry that wasn't it was a legit worry that she expressed that i didn't think of um and I think there was a point in that worry that there was, there's a danger, there's a danger there. And sometimes when that danger is there is when you kind of realize that you might be doing something important. I don't know. There, it, it, there, it's like danger in music or danger in movies. It, it's it, any creative medium, like it's going to upset someone um, that's expected because if it doesn't, then you're not really doing something that's moving anyone or touching anyone in any way shape or form even if it's you know um making them happy um so there's no doubt in my mind that eugenics is going to upset someone um and there's no doubt in my mind that the name itself will upset someone i for, for, for those in the back right who, <laughs> okay well no because you're at a point now right before so you're in the midst of something okay and you know what hey 
Evan, I hope you're coming back for this whole journey. I'm going to just pre-invite you and be like, I want to go for this whole journey. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I want to know. I want to know. So when we revisit this, you know, a, a year, a semester, three semesters, five semesters now, what was Mugenics now? Mugenics is a cat breeding simulation. That's the gameplay of it is a cat randomly generated cat breeding simulation where you take your cats you class them as you would a D&D character. You take them on a randomly generated turn-based combat adventure um, into this world. Um, and you come back with food um, for your family, um, pieces of furniture that may or may not be cursed or enchanted um, into your house, pay off your debts as you would Tom Nook, grow your house, you know, uh, grow your family, lose your family, Everyone dies. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, that's that, that's the gameplay of the game. The um, the themes that I'm exploring is kind of just about how animals are better than humans because they're not liars. <laughs> wow. okay. That's that's it. I mean, that's that that is that is boiled down to what I'm trying to say and what I'm exploring. Um, it's a it's it's about terrible human beings and these cats who are who are better simply because they're honest about what they are and they are they you know they live they make babies they eat they shit they die and you move on and there's the next generation and the next generation carries hopefully enough good and to make something better in the future and your life goes on and the game is about legacy the game is about what you leave behind um, and where that goes. And it's, um, I really love it. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not the first one to call it animal crossbreeding because that's, Oh a, yeah, that, that's a good one. That's a good like one. It's, one? It, it's, it's got so many elements of so many yeah. games that I absolutely love. Right um, on. We'll see, we'll see where, where it goes. It's, it's a, it's a harsh, it's a harsh game, but if you make the eyes really big, then it doesn't feel as harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Snort. Sorry, that's funny. Um, all right, that is an awesome moment for us break. So we're going to take a break. Students, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with student questions. Um, okay. Hopefully, um, all of you, this is an ad of the game. So if you ever want to ask a question, this is the time. You just put them in the Discord. There's a folder, questions for Edmund. Um, yeah, feel free to ask hard questions honest i'm i am an honest person and yeah. i won't lie like you can ask me the most brutally hard questions that you don't even want to hear the answer to and i will answer them honestly i'm not going to sugarcoat it i'm not here to get you to work at my company all right cool all right we'll give everyone then you know what i'll give them seven minutes of reflection okay and we're trying to 822 is that good for you Edwin? yeah i'm gonna have a, a seven minute p perfect perfect okay so 822, let's get back here. Um, everybody. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break, dude. Okay. Strategies. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, these are these are these are all tactics that that I have used, um, except with no soul and no person there. Like I I'm a I'm a firm believer if you're an independent that you should be doing your own press and you should be putting yourself out there as much as possible. And you should definitely not pay anybody else because those people, <laughs> it's their job to make money off of, you know, putting your stuff out there. Um, if you're independent and you're a game designer period, you're probably pretty smart. It wouldn't take that much thought and research to try to figure out how to basically do their job. And I, and I highly recommend as an independent to wear as many hats as possible. And that's one of them. Um, but yeah, you just go with what you know and go with what's most logical. You'd be surprised in how effective it actually is. Don't, don't throw a bunch of money, especially if you don't have it. Don't throw a bunch of money at somebody who says that they're going to put your game out there because the reality is, is even if somebody you pay somebody to advertise for you and they invest a bunch of money in Twitter ads and Facebook ads and whatever else, unless people already care about it, they're not going to just click it and check it out. It just doesn't, it doesn't translate in the way you'd think. Even... I'd even say at this point, game reviews don't. I think the things that translates the most are people playing it on, 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 on Twitch um, people and people talking about it, showing their friends. It's like the old school way of doing it. Like, did you hear about this game? It's awesome. That's what sells a game. Um, 
So do your best. <laughs> make, make the coolest thing you can possibly make. If you are really critical about your own work and you love it, then you've got something special. It'll sell itself. Um, anything else? I can't hear you. You're muted. I knew that. I knew I was muted. <laughs> Don't you come for me, Edwin Mc... <laughs> I could How the tables have turned. Of the situation. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Oh, Nick, the Sappy. Sappy, what's your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, I asked two, but I'll just I'll just say one of them. Um, how did social media influence your kind of work and your own promotional strategy? I know you did kind of get into it right now, but um, I know Isaac Online has like a big competitive scene, big fan community with the theories and the art, and there are a bunch of streamers who like made careers around Isaac, like Northern Lion. Um, did you do anything specifically to foster these communities? Did you work with them in any way, or did they kind of just like organically form? Um, I and wish I could take I wish I could take credit for any of that, but it's totally not. Like um, I, I happened to make a game that was really replayable, right? And it was so strange that people could riff off of it and be funny easily when they're streaming it. So there's a lot of talking points like, how oh, weird is this? Oh, I'm gonna, I got cancer. Well, you know, that sort of stuff. Like there's a lot of meme type uh, elements to the game that are easy for streamers to talk about. And you also kind of, that you get to go on a journey with them. It, it just happened to fit the replayability and the weirdness of the game, I think fit perfectly in the early Twitch days um, when you, you know, you wanted a, a bunch of content and you wanted to be able to be funny and whatever else on there. Um, so yeah, I wish I could say I strategized that, but I didn't know that was going to happen at all. Um, I'm glad that it, it did. When, when Isaac initially came out, it, it didn't do too well. And it wasn't until shit loads of people started streaming it it was it was actually mostly on youtube it was it was um northern lion was actually slightly late to the game um there was a guy named zach scott who um was a pretty popular youtuber at the time and he was one of the first to start playing it religiously um and uh that really kind of showed people how to play the game and i think the initially it was a hard sell because it was so weird and the design was so not like anything else um, it was hard to explain why it's fun to play this game over and over again. Mm. But when you've got somebody showing you, then it kind of translates really well. But it's, it's, it just happened. Like, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad like that it spoke to enough people and I'm glad it was playable enough on those platforms for it to be carried for 10 years. You know, it's pretty surreal. Eugia uh, Sean. Eugia, are you there? I see you there. Eugia? Hello? Can there you, you see are. Me? Hi. There you are. Oh, hi. Sorry. That's all good. Yeah, I, I send my questions on the Discord channel. Yes. Oh, do you want me to read it? I'll read it. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's um, what I saw. Yeah. You. Uh, you mentioned that you did not like programming um, and that you got help delivering for Meat Boy um, from a guy at Microsoft, from Kevin Hathaway. Um, I was wondering how specifically did he help you? Did he give you programming support? Like what does Microsoft support for an indie game designer actually look like? It looks different depending on what you want to take from them. So they offer you money and then they say, and then you say, okay, but what, what what am I giving away? And then they say, get yeah, creative control, but we'll let you, you know, we'll let you do whatever. But that was scary for me. Um, so I did not opt to take any money. So we did not get any funding. Um, what it looks like as far as what they're offering. So Kevin took took us under his wing and basically said, you do what you do. And um, I'm going to try my best to fight for your game and get you a good slot on, on a good week or whatever else. He oversaw development. He really stayed out of it, but for the most part, he was just checking in to see that if we were on, on task. And then the only thing that Microsoft did for us was they helped us with CERT. So they got us a, a dev kit because we didn't have any money. For so the non-designers, what's CERT? Oh, certification. Like you have to, you have to like, 
<clears throat> you have to make sure your game really works on a console. Like it, it's not like with PC, you can have some bugs and whatever else. And then you just fix it, right? You just update it. Back in the day, it cost four grand, upwards of four grand. You can go higher than that to simply update your game. Like they charge you to update your game. So everything needed to be right the first time. And they had a certain, you know, practices. You, you got, you have like a certain level where it's like, you this needs to be bug free by this date and it goes through certification. So it's tested repeatedly. Um, they give you a bazillion bugs that you have to fix. You get a bunch of feedback on how, you, how the game can be improved and that you, you can ignore <laughs> for the most part. Um, and uh, I mean, that was, that was fun. It was fun um, do, dealing with ESRB. They help you with that. Like, and that, so that's like the rating systems. Um, in order to get on console, you need to have a rating. Um, the cool thing about Steam, one of the many cool things about Steam is that they don't even require you to have a rating. They don't really care at all. Um, and ratings kind of suck, but especially when you're a weirdo like me that I don't really put anything explicit in my games, but it walks the line of a lot of weird stuff that turns out would make everything adult in everything that I make. So I put Binding of Isaac up for with no rating, anybody can play it, whatever else, nobody said anything about it. But when the time came to put it on console and I had to tell ESRB, the list of things that happened in this game, you know, it set off every red flag possible. So you've got to go through that and give out detailed instructions on when your character farts, for how long, how audible the fart is, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then they give you a rating for it. And that was essentially it. That was essentially what Microsoft kind of um, did for us. They did do one focus group, which was laughably awful. Um, uh, they didn't say anything about the game. They were talking about my sense of humor. And it was, yeah, it was just very odd. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's essentially what that was. I don't know if that's still like that. I don't know how much control. I think a lot of, um, a lot of consoles will either deal with a publisher like Devolver um, or if dealing with independence, if they have an established uh, established name or whatever else they probably are going to go pretty hands off like so in dealing with them after super meat boy and dealing with different consoles i basically say like hey i want to put this on a console and then i talk with somebody there and they say okay we'll set this date and then i say is there any is there any uh thing you can put us into promotion wise and whatever else and you just kind of go from there but um i i try not to work with <laughs> publishers anymore um, but so, you might have you might have to it's just it's just a necessary evil <laughs> dealing with business business dude business sucks but you got it you have to learn some about business so you don't get totally screwed over because they will they will get you they will screw you over so you have to know enough to not get screwed over um but yeah that that's I, that was the process back then but that was 10 years ago well no that was 12 years ago Jeez. Know, life. There's, yep. It's the pandemic. No one. Here's, here's, <laughs> hard. here's hard. Toby, what is your question? Oh, uh, hello. Can you yep. hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello, Emma. Uh, so my question is like, uh, like it, it appears to me that like nowadays there are more and more games out there and more and more games are like published every day. But like, I just feel like less and less people really enjoy or even like finishing a game like like we do before like take games as a belief or something you know like uh, some knots or crazy people like play games like uh till like uh, uh morning tonight or something so do you think it's just because like we grow up or i don't know i just feel like sass sometimes about i know exactly what you're talking about and i feel the same way um what I've done is I've started playing board games. <laughs> uh, I started designing board games. I mean, that's that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years. Like, yes, it, it could be life. It could be that we're getting older. It could be that we've just played it already. You know what I mean? Like, it could be that, you know, when they give me something new, like when, when Elden Ring came out, I fucking played that. Yeah, like that was awesome. What else have I played? Not much. Magic. I played, I played magic. I played kingdom death. I played a bunch of board games, you know, like, yeah, I, I feel you. I don't know. Maybe it's just that there needs to be, 
I think I think games and all artistic mediums go through this weird, you know, hill and trough situation. And I think we're in this weird shitty trough where nothing feels that inspired. And it feels like not, it's whenever there's a financial crisis, you will notice that people with money will take it, will, will not take risks and it'll become less and less risky as it goes. And with less risk, you see less variety and you see less uniqueness. Um, you see more of the same because you know that works. You get this boiled down gook and that's kind of where we're at right now. And even independents are doing it because they're investing so much time in their projects that they don't want to fuck it up. So they reference something that has already been done because they know that at least some people will come and play it. And then we're kind of left in the situation that we're kind of in. Um, it'll get better. It always does. Like it'll, it's just the ebb and flow of the way things work when it comes to finances and people taking risks. When the economy gets a little better, I think maybe people will get more comfortable with doing so. Um, but you just look at something like board games, which is very hard to make money in. <laughs> you look, you look to something where there, where money is not totally tainting the whole situation. And then you, you usually can find some gold there and you can, you can mine some gold in uh, board games or, uh, or whatever else. I'm sure there's other things out there that I'm even, not even aware of that are really cool and popular in their own weird subgenre somewhere on the internet. But um, yeah, it's kind of sucks. But uh, it'll maybe you will make the next cool thing that nobody knows is cool because that's where it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank you, like uh, making the binding on Isaac. I really like it, it enriched my uh, whole childhood and like I played it I, uh, every time I uh, went back home or and with my friends and talk, we talking about it. And yeah, really thank you. Uh, no problem at all. I'm glad, I'm glad it, oh, I'm glad, I'm awesome. glad it did something. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. I mean, now that, you, now that you have kids, like how cool, like how cool is that? <laughs> my kids hate video games. <laughs> I know, but for those <laughs> <laughs> whatever they do love whatever does matter right to i be try like i try so love. hard i try so yeah. hard i put them i just you know i don't want to be a dick about it but i put i put things in their hands and i try to get them to like there's got to be some gateway drug into into this world because for me it was like oh but i'll just put mario in front of her and then she'll play no no hate this frustrating it's like oh, oh, what can i do mind. the closest that i've gotten is pinball pinball is like oh. My like I think I mentioned in the beginning, pinball is like my new obsession. Oh, by the way, that's what this the answer to this question in the beginning. Oh, this is a this is called a um well, this is a side of a pinball table. It's called a I think it's called a blade. Mm. Um it goes on the inside of a pinball machine. Um it's art that goes on the side. I'm I've been like modding um my Godzilla machine. It's a mm. Godzilla pinball machine uh blade. So um I've been super, super into pinball uh for the past half a year and um my daughter plays it, which is super cool. <laughs> and it makes me more excited about it. So yeah, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. No, no. But I, was you, <laughs> ever, I don't know if you ever go to Vegas, but there is this place like, it's like the pinball hall thing, and they, you'll go into this, it's like a warehouse and just imagine every pinball. I wouldn't doubt it. I've been, just I've imagine. been to a few, I've been to a few places locally. Yeah. They've got like, you know, 32, 60 machines, but nothing like that. No, it's the hundreds of it's just you know, and through history, so you can go like yeah, yeah for I sure. mean, the, the ancient set, you know, and then you like you know modern thing. It's so evolved, right? Like what's with well, the if I ever yeah, if I ever get if I ever get over there, I definitely will check it out. But yeah. yeah, pinball is pinball is a very interesting, very interesting game, and it's so and it's with anything, you know, it's it's a new thing I'm experiencing. There's no doubt in my mind that after mugenics, something I make will have something that I pulled from learning this new game art form you know, from, you know, well, you know, life experience is vital. Yeah. Um, experiencing art is vital. You need to fill yourself up and you need to understand different things in order to become a better artist in general. So I highly recommend people experience as much art as possible, even if it's totally cringy or nerdy or stupid. Well, on the, the far side of that, um, we have a new major, which is experiential game design. And so, like, there's things like the kids are making like a putt putt course. <laughs> That's awesome, right? Like, yeah, yeah. About, like in college, like how cool, like they're making like That's physical, cool. That's yeah, cool. like more physical things. It's the it's part of our I, future. I think you could learn a lot from that. Uh, yeah, I think that, that that's cool. That that is an outside of the box idea that I think could be applied to game design in general. 
Yeah. Escape room homework is going to be great. It's going to be. Yeah. It's, it's so great. Disco, what is your question? Hi. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if there's any item in the Binding of Isaac that you ultimately feel unhappy with or regret adding. <laughs> there's nothing that I regret adding for the most part, but I mean, that's actively what we're doing right now. We try to like keep things alive as the years go by. And one of the things that I've been doing um, is, is uh, watching the fans, especially on Reddit or, or Discord, discuss what they believe to be the worst items in the game. Um, and they've come up with their top 10 worst items that they whittled down to the worst item. Um, and I'm going to take those 10 items and I'm going to try to make them better. And that's what we're actively kind of working on right now. And the worst item is, is I mean, I predicted it. The D10 is the worst item in the game. Um, I don't regret making it because it does have some story, you know, story to it. Like, so essentially for people who don't know, the D the D10 re-rolls every enemy in the room into a new random enemy, um, usually from the room. Uh, I think we edited it so they would be roughly the same hit points, hit point value essentially as whatever else you rolled. But there were issues originally with it where if an enemy had segments, every segment would be re-rolled into an enemy as well. Um, and it just became this totally chaotic insta-kill mess. Then we left it in for a very long time because that's, you know, it was a shitty item with, with accidental nonsense that was funny to see and experience. So we left it in so people knew that that was there. Um, but now I guess we're at the point where we'll, we'll fix it. But I regret nothing. <laughs> <laughs> wait, that, wait, wait. That's like, remember Postal? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I remember. Remember that, remember that? I regret nothing. Like, we <laughs> Before their time, I <laughs> yeah, you, you couldn't make postal these days. No, right, <laughs> right, or postal too. Anyway, um, um, because it's a different time. Andre, what is your question? <laughs> well, I'm segueing into Andre's question. Okay, Ooh, yeah, because of different times. Uh, so if you had to guess, like taking a look at the indie game industry in the past and like the community around it. Where do you think that indie games and the whole community and everything about them are going to go in the future? Like, how is it going to look like in 10 years from now, do you think? No clue. I would never, okay, so this is a story I like to tell. There was once I was part of TIG Source, TIG Source. It was a mm. forum for independent game developers. And that was back when things were really pretty small. Um, and the main site would write a little mini reviews about whatever the up and coming indie game was that was exciting. And the forums, they would just bitch at each other about stuff and they'd share, you get to share your stuff and whatever else. And this guy named Marcus put um, a, a build of one of his games up, which I don't remember what it was called at the time. And it was this game where everything was cubes and you go around and you just dig into the earth and there was randomly generated caves. The fuck is this? I remember playing it and be like, this isn't fun. <laughs> I was wrong. It turns out I was really wrong because that was Minecraft and it became the biggest video game of all time. Um, there is absolutely no way to predict what the next thing is. Um, but I'll tell you right now, it's going to be something that no, but that doesn't exist now. It's definitely not going to be a clone of a game that already exists. Um, it's not, it's going to be a left field, totally out of the blue, crazy thing that is going to it might even be shitty <laughs> you, you you never know it could just be a flash in the pan that gets super huge and that's all it is um it could be great um there's no way to predict it but i think it's important to know that though i think it's important to know that if you if you're in the mood to strike some serious gold and you're not going to risk shit loads of your life and and money doing it you're better off doing something really out of left field, really odd, really risky, but good. That's the important thing. Like it still has got to be good, but make something that isn't, that doesn't exist right now. And you have a higher probability of hitting that, like something totally crazy. That could be the next, you know, what was the, what was the last one that was super odd? Friday night Funkin'. Like yeah. where that, like that, that's it. Who would have thought? <laughs> like, who would have thought Friday Night Funkin' would bring Newgrounds back from the grave? You know, you know what I mean? Um, there's just so many games that are so left field that you would never think that would become this thing. Um, uh, but they're always the games that are 
the riskiest, weirdest, oddballest to take no, you know, don't make any compromises and just put it out there. Oh, what's, what's that one? The, um, um, my God, I'm so blanking on it. Um, the, the, the one that kids of meme like crazy, the sus, what is it? Tell me. Among us? us? Among us? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Among us. That's a game. That was, by, I think that was by Newgrounds kids as well. There was some Newgrounds kids that just put it up there and no one cared at all until some random streamer played it and then popularized it. And now it's the biggest fucking thing in the world. It's like, we're, I remember contacting them when I was working on, um, four souls i was doing these little promotional things and i had to go i had to go through a team of people to like get to them and they have like a guideline of how you know what not to do you, you can't you're not supposed to say sauce either which is weird because that's like the everybody knows it is, is that but they don't they don't say it and i can't say that on the card because i was like i wanted it to be called sus right yeah. no you no so there's like a whole corporation behind this teeny, teeny, tiny little, you know, thing, which is crazy. Like, um, but that, that's what can happen when you make something that is just not like other stuff or like something else that exists in a different realm, because that did exist in a different realm, you know, in board games, like werewolf and, 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 and mafia, like that existed for forever. Right. But they just retranslated it into this online game and it totally worked. So you about, about your game being played like now like you're making a game right to be played but that's different than it being streamed like does that cross your mind that now it's hard to it? it's it's hard to um avoid it crossing okay. your mind right there's definitely okay. like but um you, you want to stay true to the game regardless as if, if if that existed you know what i mean you don't want to um mm -hmm. like i'm sure there'll be a point in time where we were like oh we should probably do some sort of twitch integration to make things cool like make the cats names that are generated based off of the chat you know yeah. stuff like that um but never okay. never i don't think it's a good idea unless you're going to be a flash in the pan game which is fine um to completely make a game specifically to to be streamed um you okay. want people you know to play it. Yes. <laughs> Steve, Steven. Which pick. question? You uh, you pay. You live your life. Pick you you pick. Shoot your shot. Excellent. Thank you. Uh Edmund, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I saw you last year and I just really appreciate being able to talk to you. Um I'm an indie game developer, and uh, my question is, I'm super worried about Indie Apocalypse that there are so and you talked about this a little bit already, that there are just so many games coming out all the time every day that how could you possibly get exposure and yeah. that um being more capable than ever of actually making and releasing something is paradoxically making it impossible to get anyone to play your game um but i heard from a, a different guest in this class that content is really king and that every every online retailer for games and every publisher is really just like looking for like the next big thing or the thing that's like out of left field like you were saying uh, and I was just wondering if you felt that one was like more prevalent than the other. And what do you think like the future of games is in like the next few years? Do you see lots more like self-derivative indie games? Or do you think that the market that that like the variety of games coming out is actually going to get richer because everyone want, wants content? Uh, no, I see more of the same. Like I said before, like I, I'm until until people's finances get better until you know, there's a better influx of, until our economy gets better, I, I foresee for the most part, things being pretty much boiled down and sequelitis for the most part. Um, it, and I would say these things because I know that I have a natural instinct to feel the same way. Like I could make the binding of Isaac too. I could be working on that right now. I want to, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I would just do that. Like, why would I take a risk and do something different? Um, and, and as an artist, you've got to, avoid that like you've got to you've got to deflect those things because the the closer I, I always use the analogy of like so there's art and then there's business and they're complete polar opposites and you could say that art is truth and that business is lie right and you gotta you gotta move a little towards the lying in order to sell something or no one's gonna care right but you gotta you gotta try your best not to go too far because then it just becomes business. And there's a lot of games that are very successful that are just business, like literally crunching numbers and manipulating users to give money. 
like a slot know? machine. Yes, it's a, yes. Um, they've been around forever, and they're still on everybody's phones, except they're completely illegal in all states. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, um, I I don't I I can't predict the future, but if I I would bet on simply looking at the economy and seeing like okay, well, things usually things you artists usually thrive and logically companies take bigger risks on riskier projects when they have more money to throw around and investing in something isn't going to cripple a company. Cause we're at that point now where they, they do know that they, they know that like, okay, if we put this much money into this and it completely bombs, we're done. So they're only going to bet on something that is a sure thing. And the only things that are sure things are things that have already been done, which aren't sure things. <laughs> so so interesting. So. Like if you, I mean, if someone did some paper, I got paper who does paper anymore, but like, about like great works of art, like when art moved forward, forget the medium and being like how that would tie to economics. Like, you know, things really like, you know, when they're making the Sistine Chapel, they need to make it, we need all the paint. No, we need it all, it's gotta be on the roof, right? <laughs> Someone to make like a real tight budget call, right? It's and true like, though, right? Yeah, because right? art art is always gonna play second fiddle to needs, yeah. right? It's, it's only when you're financially comfortable and everything's okay that you're gonna pay somebody, you know, um, 10 years worth of food to yeah. do something that doesn't matter, you know, it like yeah. doesn't help anybody. Yeah. Um, Terracotta yeah. soldiers, things were booming when it's time to make those, right? Like, it's one, one of the beauties of, yeah. you know, growing up in the 90s. The 90s yeah. were like a great time for art mm. um, because people were taking risks, businesses were taking risks on art because art was proving to become financially viable. Um, and then they boiled it down into pop and, you know, things just, they figured out how to milk milk whatever was there. It happens. Jack Brasesco. Uh, that was me, right? I can hear you. All right, great. Um, so I thought your uh, make 10 small games concept was really helpful, but um, just in my personal life, it's hard for me to get excited about making smaller projects when like, I have specific big ideas that like I've been working on for you know, something fast. And also I just like think they're really great. <laughs> Um, so my question is, in your early career, did you just like know logically that it was the right thing to do for yourself to make those small games, or was there something else that was bad? No, I made mistakes. I, I I I bit off more than I could chew, and I failed. Um, I uh, so it's hard to understand until you've experienced making a bunch of small things, um, and because the big idea is always so alluring, right? But think of it as the big idea, the probability of the big idea happening is small. Um, even, even releasing, even getting close to releasing, um, especially when you're early in your career, just try your best to look at it like that. Because when you bite off more than you can chew, the probability of you just never releasing it or simply not having enough experience to actually give it what it needs in order to become something great is it's low it's it's super super low and i think as a game designer you should and could um it, it, figure out mental gymnastics that make you excited about this small project and i think you can find that and it, it, and i would go as far as to saying that you're making an excuse for yourself of of, of, of avoiding doing a small project um you can, you can get very excited about a small thing. Um, it's not gonna, it's not going to live up to this fiction of this giant thing in your mind, but I promise you that when you release it, you're gonna feel good. And releasing something feels really good because it feels like you've done something and you've made it real. It's, it's when you're working on a project, it's just a hypothetical idea. It doesn't exist in the real world and it doesn't exist in the real world until you release it. And experiencing releasing something, even if it's something small, even if it's something shitty, um, it gets you prepared and it gives, it actually simply, simply as a, 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 on a brain chemistry level, it's important for you to give yourself the good juice and you get the good juice from releasing. You don't get the good juice from working for years. It doesn't. The juice goes away and you feel like shit and you dig yourself into a deep, dark hole and you die in it. You need to replenish yourself. And in, in the best way to do that and learn is to make a bunch of small projects because you will get those good juices when you release something. 
you'll feel good about it. You'll feel accomplished and you'll feel motivated and you'll know, how could I do this better next time? What, de- what direction can I go? And the, the, the ride, you know, in, in, of this, you know, three month, four month project is you'll learn so much through this little itty bitty thing because it's so condensed into this little thing with the next thing you'll, you'll get better at it. You become more efficient. Your next game, even though it'll be a three month project, it'll be bigger than the previous one because you'll know more. And then eventually you'll get to that point where when you double down on this dream project, it'll probably still be your dream project. It'll probably still be pretty similar, but you'll have learned so much from those little projects that it will be more lush and understood and you'll have a better understanding of how to tackle it because tackling a big project like that is not some, it's not something that people can do unless they've tackled a bunch of little projects. Sounds um, like an RPG a little bit. Sure. Know? I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in designing your workflow in the same way you would design a game for somebody else to play. It's important because you need to give yourself the reward. You can't just do boring shit the whole day. You need to find the stuff that is the dessert and you need to give yourself a little dessert at the end of the day. You need to be able to carry yourself through in a strategically designed manner so you don't burn out or start hating the project that you're working on. I also don't over-design. It's important to not over-design. That's something I didn't know for many years as well. When you over-design something, you'd be surprised in how much you will feel like you like, I've already seen that. I've already done that. It's been in my head 10 times over. I know exactly how it's going to play out. It becomes less and less exciting as it goes. One of the reasons why I'm excited about the projects that I'm working on is because there's an unknown variable to them. I don't write that shit until I get there because I want it to be exciting and I want it to be fun for me to do. I don't over-design because I want the game to find itself as I'm working on it and tell me what it wants. And I won't become so rigid as a designer feeling like, no, I wrote this on paper and this makes sense and I'm gonna go with this. You know, when you open yourself up more to the design flow and let things happen, you'd be surprised how many bugs become features. How, how a game that you think is a really good idea turns out one element of that game is actually really fun and your idea was shit. Like, but that one element, it's so cool that you could expand on it, you know, infinitely and you would never know because you, you, you didn't dive into that little area. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, there's just so many weird holes you can fall into as a designer that I fell into so many um, because they are so alluring. Um, but I promise you <laughs> that it's better, it's better in the long run to do small games, but you can still have the dream project. You know, you can still have it and it will only make it better when you do it. And it will only make you have a larger fan base when you release it. And it will only make you a more experienced designer overall. And it'll also help you with the eventual depression you will feel when you release something and it's done because that sucks too. And it's good to get your feet in the water with that because when you work on something for an extended period of time and you put it out and you can't work it anymore, it feels like there's a hole in your soul. And that takes getting used to. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, a million reasons I could give you on why small projects are the way to go. Um, trust me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Please believe me. Well, we have, we have a related question from Caroline Zhu. Caroline. Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. There you are. One second. Um, so when coming up with game ideas and like, the early stages of game development, how can you differentiate between ideas that will become great games versus ideas that don't seem to have that much potential? Uh, The best way to do that is, so you got to boil the idea down to the core. So like with Super Meat Boy, it's platforming, right? And I'm trying to reinvent something that already exists, but there are elements of the game. It's like when you boil a platformer down to its core, what are you doing? What's fun about it? It's kind of like, being a superhero you never want it platforming games that feel laggy and slow suck you know what i mean so i I wanted it to be as fast as possible so i came up with a few key elements a lot of it was wall jumping that i hadn't seen a lot of in games a really fast wall jump really fast momentum carrying the, the character back and forth across across the uh the level excuse me 
that little core element, I looked at that and I said, how can I expand on this specific thing? And can I, can I carry this through a game? Can I carry something as basic as wall platforming, momentum and speed and make it fun throughout? And then I went through and I came up with a few ideas here and there. So basically it's like, okay, you jump over something that's fun, right? So that's one thing. Okay, you jump over it and it's also moving. You, you jump over it and then you have to drop back under it. You know, you, you want to explore the core mechanic and make sure it can be expanded upon multiple, multiple ways. And if that is fun, then you can continue to move with it. But you prototype it first. Like it, it's super, super important to have the foundation of what you are making in a prototype form and then know confidently that you can take this and carry it. I remember I used to do, um, I used to do talks at UCSC here in, in Santa Cruz. And one of the most common things I saw with the developers there is that they would come up with this really cool idea. It was a really cool, like core idea. And I could see right away that you couldn't go anywhere with it. Like it was a dead end, like it was a hard dead end and you could not expand upon it. But it was such a cool idea that they just stuck with it. And they continued to make, instead of expanding upon the idea, and they couldn't, um, they would take the idea and just reiterate the same thing you kind of did. And you, you, it turns into this kind of like boring experience. And I won't shit on this game, but um, back in the day, I played this game called Fez. Um, and uh, I remember playing it and thinking, there's no way, there's, there is no way you can expand upon this core mechanic because there's no way for you to memorize four planes of existence in any way that would be feasible for a human brain to, it's not a puzzle. Like you just got to guess and you got to spin it. But he got away with it. <laughs> he got away with spinning that thing and he, and he fluffed it and he made the platforming fun and he made it work. But initially I would have, I would have completely written that game off and said like, this is a mechanic that you, that doesn't work. I told him that, I, honestly, I said, it's a mechanic that doesn't work. Um, I, I don't know how you're going to turn this into something, <laughs> but you know, kudos to him for actually doing it. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, I would say you, 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 you know, you know, usually, you know, you'll feel it in your gut right away that the mechanic, the core mechanic that you've come up with is expandable and fun um, by prototyping it putting it in front of, it is another thing I haven't talked about at all. Um, putting your game in front of people who don't even play video games. Mm. Putting your game in front of people that you don't even, would, wouldn't even associate with, random people, and, and hand them the controller and have them play it. If, it. if it speaks to people who don't even, aren't even interested in that, then you might have something really special and it'll solidify your assumption. Um, but that is super important too. And it's something that I do religiously with all of my games is I, you know, for, for the end is nigh, I, I would bring um, a laptop to uh, some Magic the Gathering tournaments at the mall. I'd set the laptop up with a controller. I'd put it down. No one knew who the hell I was. And people would just kind of gravitate towards it and play it. And I'd watch them. I'd say nothing. I would just watch them. And you can learn so much, especially what works, what puts a smile on somebody's face, which gives them an aha moment, which makes them feel smart, which makes them feel good in accomplishing something. That it's, it's, a, it's a key element to game design that I totally missed this whole time talking about, um, is getting your game in front of people and watching them. Not saying anything to them, not asking for feedback, never, don't do that. Um, because once you say that, then they'll feel like they need to give you something and it's usually just trash. Um, they're just trying to, they're trying to help. Are you coming in here? Right, <laughs> Danielle's no. laughing. My wife is laughing in the background. Awesome. <laughs> with that. Um, well, but, we're, yeah. in the, we're in the home stretch. We're in the home stretch here. We'll do maybe even three <laughs> more and get back to your, get back to your family. Um, I'll pick here. Let me cure. Let me curate one second. All right. Okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, Allison. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We're in the home stretch. We'll get you out of here by we'll get out of here by nine thirty for sure, Alice. And thank you by the way for taking all this time. 15, 15. Yeah. Oh, I'm not hungry. I ate. I ate my dinner. Oh no, no, maybe just some ice water. I know she wants to get in here and play the pinball machine. 
Oh, amazing. Okay. <laughs> okay. How, how, how many film machines do you have? Is it a, the Godzilla machine is the machine or you have a... No, a, I have um, Adam. I have Adam's family and Godzilla in my office. Amazing. Um, and I also have... Um, I'm not one to brag about these Flex. things, but... Flex. I, don't, <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a Medieval Madness. Um, I have a Twilight Zone and I have a Monster Bash in my garage, which I've been slowly turning into a, an arcade. I have a pool table as well that we just put in. Oh, right on. Awesome. You're okay. I, I, okay. I, I, won't I like games. I no, like I, games. I love games also. <laughs> I, I love games also. I'm all like, so where in Santa? You know, <laughs> this sounds fun. I um, like games and I, and I love watching other people play games too, which right. is kind of weird. I guess that's kind of interesting in itself. I really enjoy watching other people have fun playing games and stuff. So Alice's door, I'm going to ask Alice's question really quickly, which is what are your favorite and least favorite binding of isaac characters <laughs> smiley face <laughs> smiley face one of my favorite characters um i i think my favorite characters are i make mean, my favorite characters maybe right now is probably eden because eden stays true to what the binding of isaac is which is like full random um least favorite jacob and esau mm. again i think everybody's least favorite is that <laughs> Nice. All right. My next. wife, my wife hates him. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Um, next question, second to last. Uh, we'll go with um Eric Mazer. Eric, you there? Yeah, yeah. Hi. All right. What's your question? Uh with the abrasiveness of the games and your worth ethic work ethic, uh, I imagine you've burned multiple bridges throughout your career. I was curious how you kind of navigate that with your future games and also if like, there's any regrets going about this. Um, uh, I think the only bridges that I've burned, I mean, they're not, well, I think I intro this saying that I've been banned from GDC for an unknown reason. Um, I don't even know how banned exactly, but um, I definitely, it definitely has something to do with me being very critical about their judging process after being a judge uh, for the IGF for many years. I have a feeling anyway. Um, don't burn bridges until you can. <laughs> That's my recommendation. It's not going to help you. Um, I mean, I, I got to a point where I knew that I, I knew that, okay, so I'm not like a shit talker just to talk shit, but I'd like to talk shit to make sure other people don't fall into the same mistakes that I did. You know what I mean? I like to be honest about that. So in hopes that somebody else can avoid the bullshit and the heartache that I've had to endure. Um, now, I don't care. <laughs> like I, I, I didn't care before. And after having a financial cushion, I care so much less. Um, about anything other than what I'm doing um, and what I'm working, you know, what I'm working on. I mean, that's it. It's, 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 I, I, I wish I, I wish I had more I could say other than the fact that I don't care. Um, but for sure, I mean, obviously I've burned bridges because I'm not allowed to go on stage at GDC. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you know what it might be, it might per, be like personal it personal right. relationships yeah. I, I i'm not i'm not remotely a bad guy um i'm just an honest guy and i don't i don't i really don't let i don't like it when people are shitty and i don't like business um and i don't like a lot of business people um i don't care <laughs> i don't i really don't care um, and I probably wouldn't care even if I had no success because I didn't care before. Um, I just give credit where credit is due. And there's a lot of really fucking great people out there and there's a lot of shitty people out there and I just keeps it real. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm gonna, God, there's a lot of, you know what? I'm going to pick this one because this actually relates it relates to pinball in a way, but it's okay. not, not. I wish it were. I wish this were a pinball question. You can make it a pinball question, but I'll, I'll let Luke Holland bring us home with your final question. Okay, thank you. So my question is: How did the binding of Isaac for Souls come to be? Did you plan on the binding of Isaac ever becoming a tabletop game? No. Um, it's pretty funny. 
So uh, <laughs> it kind of loops back around into business people and me like not having uh, much of a, I can't tolerate them. Um, I got contacted. I, so when you have any kind of success, you'll have these headhunters and they'll come for you and they'll be like, we want to exploit something for financial gain that you've done. And then you've got to be like, is this worth my credibility? <laughs> and uh, basically I got contacted by a studio I never heard of. Um, they said, we want to, can we acquire the rights to the Binding of Isaac to turn it into a board game for Kickstarter? And I said, that's the stupidest idea. Stupidest idea in the world. No, of course not. And the guy said, well, I'm a big fan of the game and um, let us know if you're, you change your mind. And what happened there was they planted a seed and it was a challenge seed. And it was me thinking like, wait, am I blowing this off because I think it would be a shitty idea or am I blowing this off because I'm not up to the challenge of turning something like a video game into a board game. And it just sat there for like a year in the back of my mind of like, could I, could I, could I do something like this? And would this be fun? And after a year passed, I think I, um, I got, I got the, I think I got the flu and I was like sick for a week. And I was just kind of sitting on the couch doing nothing. And I really wanted to make a game. I really wanted to make something. So I came up with this card game idea that kind of abstracted the Binding of Isaac into a card game. And I tested it with my wife, like within, you know, a few hours of, of, of roughing it out. And the dice rolls were fun. It was just kind of experimenting with some of the stuff that I, I learned with with um, board games over, over the years. It's just like, what's fun, what's not? Like social interaction, dice rolls, and how exciting, how stupidly exciting dice rolls are um, when you got people around. It's kind of odd how, um, how effective that is. Um, and, and then I emailed them and I said, is that offer still oh. on the table? <laughs> oh my God. This is Brittany. No, no my wife is Danielle. The cat oh, is great. Brittany. Hello, both of you. Hello. And you will be on the pinball. That was the last question. I what does does wait now? Wait, you're the cat is Brittany. The cat is Brittany. Okay. Is My Brittany wife is Danielle in Mugenics. Hi, Danielle. This is Gordon. Thank Brittany. you. Thank you so much. Is Brittany making an appearance in Mugenics? That is that is a question everyone's gonna want to know. Well, of, of course, in a way. Um okay. the cats are randomly generated and, and I base all their pieces. So they're the cats are made of thousands of pieces, right? That are randomly oh. generated and placed together. Okay. So this coat and this type of cat, the pieces are all in there somewhere. Well, yeah, because see this, this randomly generated nose is too small. <laughs> <laughs> so when she gets like really, uh, when she's playing a lot, she starts panting like a dog. Yeah, no. she's defective. We uh, we got her from a breeder. I mean, it's it kind of goes with the theme of the game. No, they uh, by eugenics. Yeah, turns turn, turns out you're not supposed to. I don't know if you know this about, about no. pugs. They 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 frown upon it with pugs. When you breed a pug, the nose can't go above their eyes. <laughs> they they have to has to stay below the eye line. But the people are because because they want it to be as cute as possible. So they keep pushing its nose. and They keep trying to breed its nose up. And with with these little Persian not Persian. What is she? Domestic. Uh, um exotic short hair with yeah. these ones with a smashed face look um they keep trying to make their nose smaller because it looks cuter because it's just eyes on a head right without yeah. the nose but there's rules against that because the cat won't survive if the nose is too small mm -hmm. it won't it doesn't work and that's oh. eugenics for you wow but we, it turns out the nose is a little too small they bred <laughs> that nose a little too small oh. the other cats they got i've noticed that their noses are a little bigger and hopefully she's fine but her yeah. nose is, is oddly small um, but also pretty darn cute. So on that note, for these students who want to continue to follow you, many students are discovering you for the first time tonight. And how do they follow Mugenics? How do they follow you? How do they learn more? Oh, I do shit posts on Twitter, which is Edmund McMillan on Twitter. And that's basically where I live. Um, that's the only means of reach that I have to fans at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I will one day mugenics.com will be alive again and it'll it'll have a blog on it and i'll actually delve back into that whole exposing i'm not a fan of exposing active development but um it's here's something strategic for you it's a, it fills you up a little bit it gives you a little juice when you get to show 
the world a little piece of what you're working on and you hear them excited about it and they hear you excited about it. So I'm not only doing this for press, but I'm also doing it for morale to keep mm. it up, to make it feel like things are moving forward and to be excited about the project. Well, speaking of morale, will everyone please take a moment and thank our guest, Evan Millen, who took all this time with you tonight to answer so many questions and share so much of the truth uh, <laughs> about games. This is what the class is all about. So this is great. Could, I cannot think of a better class before the drop for you to know if this is for you. If this is for you, if you're vibing this, come back next week. There's more. If you're not your vibe, that's also okay. I want you to be free. I want you to live your lives. I want you to thrive in your own way. We hope you'll join us. Same time next week. Thank you, Danielle. Oh, I got baby. Baby, hold on. We're, we're breeding this one with a really big forehead. Oh, adorable. Come here. Adore head. Hello. What's, what's, what's their name? Uh, oh, uh, this is Minnie. Here, Minnow. If he's Minnow? Down. She's a girl. Uh, okay. Hello. Oh my gosh. Welcome. Oh, this is the best end of class. Just do you want to say period. hi? Let's see these guys. Say hi. Hi. Hello. There's a lot going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on. It's red. Yeah, it's red. Yes. All right. So wait. So min wait, minnow like a fish. Like minnow? Like minnow like a fish. Oh, well, minnow, wonderful meeting all of you. It is clearly pinball time. She's Everybody. named after she's named after Guppy from the Bunny Eyes. She's just another little fish. That's amazing. Um, okay, it is okay. pinball time. It is family. Okay. <laughs> this is that? so great. All right, it is family okay. pinball time. Oh, we will let you go. Thank you so much, oh, Evan. Like I super oh, appreciate it. Um, just thank oh, you. No thank problem. You, thank you. Thank you. Have wonderful evening. Hope just I said something class. that 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 will affect somebody positively. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no. You have there's there's no homework this week before the before the before the drop. So everyone just come back next week. Hopefully, we will see you all. Oh, wait, um, essays. Do what? we have a speaker for next week? Who's coming next what? week? Do we know? Oh, let me check it out. Right check it out, now. Andre. What what's going on? Yeah, let's find out. Uh, <laughs> next week we have Joe Quadara from Who's that? He was a content designer, and uh, now he's doing, I think, publishing at Recurve, his own studio. So he did some uh, entrepreneurship and then got there. Yeah. Uh oh, so we're keeping it independent. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Um, looking forward to it. Um, yeah. Talk to everyone next week, same time. Um, we'll find out. We'll find out in the Discord whether we're in person or over Zoom. Um, period. Bye. Uh, <laughs> thank bye, you so much. Have a good week, bye. everyone. Okay. Want to say bye? Thank you so much. For say bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs> thank next you. Time. Time. Next time. Is there any way to get her nose between her eyes? <laughs> yeah, you're talking about breeding foreheads. <laughs> Where's it coming oh. from? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording. Okay. We'll figure out how to get it to you. Do you want to have a recording cloud? You will see your notification on the cloud recording. We'll figure out how to get it to you because I know yeah. you're outside the USC system. So we'll have to figure that out. But 